So here we are. Welcome to our final live presentation about the Tour du Mont Blanc, and thank you for joining us. My name is Marvin Faure, and I'm the founder and general manager of Alpine Colts, which is a group of cycling coaches based in the Alps. In this presentation, I'm going to talk about how to get your best result at the Tour du Mont Blanc on the day itself. So let's take a look at the, uh, at the, the parkour. The Tour du Mont Blanc is often referred to as the toughest one-day sportive in the world. Suffice to say that it covers 330 kilometers, includes 8,300 meters of climbing, over five major climbs and a whole bunch of smaller ones. These are huge numbers and you mustn't take this event lightly. It's, it's really a very, very serious uh, endurance challenge. It's a real ultra event. Uh, everybody starts in the dark at five o'clock in the morning. And unlike the guy in the photo, many will finish after nightfall, uh, perhaps having to do the descent from the Cormier de Roseland in the dark, as well as the final climb to the Saisy in the dark. Uh, the cutoff time to finish is midnight. So all finishers take somewhere between uh, roughly 12 and 19 hours. Starting at five, you need to be finished 19 hours later by, by midnight. Uh, in a good year, the, the attrition rate is around 40%, but it's better not to ask how high it is when the weather is bad. There's no classification. It's above all an endurance challenge. And although everybody is timed, you know, there's no official classification and all finishers receive a medal and a well-deserved gold certificate. It's really a challenge on three levels. And we'll come back on these several times through the presentation. So it's a, it's a mental challenge, it's a physical challenge, and it's a nutritional challenge. Uh, and it's in that order. The most likely reason to abandon is mental. For most first timers, it will be the toughest thing you've ever done, probably by some margin. At the halfway point, you'll have ridden almost the equivalent of the marmot, but it's still only halfway. And to reach the finish, you'll probably push yourself to your limits and then have to go beyond them. You're going to find new limits uh, in finishing this event. You can expect to experience highs and lows, with moments of euphoria where you feel really good and moments of despair when you feel terrible. And many people think of quitting more than once during the day. Uh, those who are prepared properly can usually find the tenacity and the determination they need to keep going. But before we get into the details of the day itself, we're still a month away from it. So let's just have a quick look at the final month, what you should be doing in the next four weeks. What's most important of all in this final month is to eliminate fatigue while maintaining your fitness. So that means you obviously can't stop riding because then you'd lose fitness, but you, mustn't, uh, you must no longer uh, build fatigue uh, at this point. That, that's, it's too late now. So you need to progressively reduce your training volume by 50%, at least 50% even, and uh, limit the intensity. There's really little point, in my view, in doing any high-intensity work for the, in the last month before the Tour du Mont Blanc. If you must do any for whatever reason, if you really feel you need it, keep it short and sweet. Above all, focus on yourself, on your general health, on sleeping well, eating well, staying supple. So keep doing uh, flexibility exercises, keep, uh, keep doing you know, Pilates or yoga or whatever, whatever it is you do. Limit the stress in your life, limit any, try to as much as possible, limit any extra demands on you, whether they be at work or, or whether they be, uh, whether it be at home or, or anything else, just try to limit all the stress on your, on your life, because it will, that will really pay when you come to the, uh, to the event itself. Full recovery is in fact much more valuable for you than 95% recovery. At 95%, you could easily lose 20% of your performance potential over the last two climbs. Now, that sounds like a lot, but it's, it's, it's absolutely true. If you, you go into this event not fully recovered, you will suffer and you may have trouble finishing. So, so that's the message I want to leave you with. Of course, you've got to keep riding in this final month, but uh, don't do anything crazy. And above all, you know, start tapering. Uh, from now on. When I say reduce training volume by 50%, I don't mean immediately for this weekend, of course, but over the course of this, of the next two weeks, bring it down by 50%. So now let's get into the, uh, the event day itself. There are three essentials during the event to get right. It's the pacing, your pacing, your fueling, and your mental approach to, to the day, and particularly to any difficulties you, you, you run into which you almost inevitably will. So we're going to look at each of those in turn. 
Before we get into de the detail of the pacing, we need to clarify, or, or, or you need to clarify for yourself, what is your objective? Because your pacing strategy is going to depend on it. There are two, really two possible objectives for the Tour du Mont Blanc. It's either to finish as fast as possible. You might, if you've done it before, you obviously know what you did before and you might want to, to go for a faster time. You can also imagine what time you might. So you could give yourself an objective for the fastest time. Alternatively, you just, if it's your first time, I would suggest the best objective is just to finish before the cutoff. Which objective you choose leads to a different pacing strategy. So we're going to look at that now. If your objective is to finish the fastest possible, then you're going to have to ride as close as possible to your limits without ever going over them. What that means is to climb at the highest pace you can sustain for 157 kilometers of climbing. It's enormous. It's way, way, way more than, uh, than the Marmot. Uh, for example, for example, which is 65 kilometers of climbing and which is more than enough for most people. So on the Tour du Mont Blanc, you're going to have to do 157 kilometers. So what is the highest pace you can sustain for that? And in a minute, I'll go through with you how you the, how you can work that out, how you, you're looking at your own data, well, how you can work that out. If your objective, on the other hand, is just to finish before the cutoff, you need to work backwards from the official cutoff times. Which are these? You've got you've got to get through the Bourg Saint Maurice cutoff point by eight o'clock in the evening. Otherwise, they uh, they won't let you go on. There's a second cutoff on the Corme de Roseland at ten thirty, twenty two thirty. So those are vital. If you want to finish, you've got to get through those two. Now, I calculate in order to stand the best chance of making those two cutoffs, you need to be through the feed station at Les Valettes which is at the foot of the Col de Champex by 10 a.m., which means an average speed of 22 kilometers per hour because that's 110 kilometers after the start. So 10 a.m. at Les Valettes, and then two o'clock or 1400 hours on the Col, on the summit of the Grand Saint Bernard. It's important to recognize that if your only goal is to finish, it makes no sense to try to beat these cutoffs by a large margin. Okay, if your only goal is to finish, you need to beat those cutoffs, but you don't have to beat them by, by an hour, for example. Uh, the risk of trying to do that is you go too hard too early, and then you're unable to finish. So it's better to hold back, start easy, and finish relatively strong, if you've got, an, if you've got the ability to finish strong, which you may or may not have by then. So how do you know which pace is going to be sustainable for you for 157 kilometers of climbing? You need to look at the evidence and not base it on hope. Okay, this is an absolutely key point. Miracles don't happen very often, and it's unlikely that you're going to be much stronger on the Tour du Mont Blanc than you were in training or at other events. So you need to look at the evidence. So what evidence can you use to determine your pace? Well, the first place to look, if you have a power meter, is at your power duration curve. This is a personal example. So you can see from that that my critical power or my FTP, they're more or less the same, is 275 watts. So in theory, I should be able to hold 275 watts for 50 to 60 minutes. However, the problem is that 50 to 60 minutes isn't enough to get up any of the long climbs on the Tour du Mont Blanc. And in any case, I wouldn't be able to repeat it over and over again. So we have to look now for other evidence to see what fraction of critical power I might be able to climb at for 10 hours or more. OK, we'll, we'll, we'll clearly be down at this bottom end of the curve. But I can't read it directly off here because this number down here, of course, is an average power over the whole day of those rides. Was, these, these were rides of 10, 11 hours. But the average power over the whole day is not useful. What I want to know is the average power I can sustain on the climbs. So for that, we need to dig a little bit deeper. So here I've uh, summarized the data from a, a bunch of um, long distance events that I've done with a lot of climbing in them. Uh, so there's Liège Bastion Liège, there's uh, Mallorca 312, there's the Sangle de Ventoux, uh, there's the Marmot, and the Songkol's uh, Challenge Corsica, uh, which is a, a multi-day event, 10 days long, where you ride almost 200 kilometers and almost 4,000 meters of climbing per day for 10 days. So that was interesting to look at. And then, of course, the Tour du Mont Blanc itself, I've never done the, I haven't personally done yet the whole tour, 
Uh, but last year I did it in two days, the whole court tour in one day, I mean. But last year I did the whole tour in two days. So that provides some interesting data, of course, as well. Now, what I've done there is I've put my average power on the climbs, and then I've given you the percentage of critical power. What's relevant for you is not the absolute, absolute power, because that, that's only relevant to me, really. But what is relevant is the percentage of critical power. If you've got a watts per kilo, which is similar to mine, which is around 3.9, then this, it could be appropriate reference. So what does that uh, mean for the Tour du Mont Blanc? You, you've got to be conservative because it's, uh, at, least, at least I have to be conservative because when you look at those distances and the altitude gains, they're all significantly less than the Tour du Mont Blanc. Yes, the Mallorca 312 is nearly the same in distance, but it's only half the climbing. Uh, so it can't be directly compared. So I think I need to be very conservative. I'm going to knock it down to 165 watts, which is just 60% of my critical power or FTP. Note that the higher your critical power per kilogram, the higher your target percentage of critical power can be because you're going to get up the climbs quicker, quite simply. And the opposite is equally true. Again, mine is about 3.9. So if yours happens to be well above that, 4.2, 4.3, or, 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 or even more, then you might be able to sustain a slightly higher percentage of your critical power if you've got the endurance to do that. Uh, you could obviously do it over, over a number of clients, but do you have the endurance to do it over all of them? That's a question only you can answer. Now, if you don't have a power meter, you're going to have to rely upon something else. Uh, the most obvious thing is your heart rate. So I've given the same data for heart rate as a percentage of my maximum heart rate, uh, and you can analyze the same data and, and use that. Now, the thing about heart rate data compared to power is that power measures the external load, while heart rate measures the internal load. And the internal load, as time goes on, tends to get, tends to increase. Uh, you probably notice that the relationship between your heart rate and your power doesn't stay constant for very long. And depending on how aerobically fit you are and on in external conditions and maybe other factors such as possible dehydration, you may see your heart rate start to rise significantly relative to your power after the first two, three or four hours. And since the heart rate is measuring the internal load, it would be prudent to slow down and ride more to heart rate than power uh, after the first uh, few hours. So what I'm going to do for, for that is uh, I'm going to target around 105 uh, beats per minute over the, uh, over the first climbs. And then when I get to the Col de Champex, I know that that's a steep and quite difficult climb. So I know my heart rate will go up a bit. So I'm going to allow it to rise maybe to 67, 68% of my, of my max. And then ultimately over the final climbs, I'll, I'll allow it to rise to 72%. Uh, Maybe, maybe a little bit more if I'm feeling, uh, feeling strong and feel that I can reach the end like that. So that's the, that's the evidence uh, from previous events. You then need to consider that, uh, that things might cause you to increase or reduce that slightly on the day. It may need some adjustments up or down, depending on a certain number of factors. The first one is the weather, uh, particularly if it's going to be very hot, you may need to adjust it down. Your recent training, how hard you've been training recently, how, how fatigued you are, the quality of your taper, where you're able to, uh, uh, to bring your fatigue right down, the amount of stress you are under over the last, um, particularly the last two weeks, could you keep that uh, down to reasonable levels? Uh, the quality of your sleep, particularly in the last week, um, not so much the last night, because the last night you can probably expect to sleep badly and that's not necessarily going to impact you very much. One, night, one night's poor sleep doesn't really impact very much. It's, it's the previous nights. It's, it's Thursday, Wednesday and Thursday night that must be uh, the best possible. Your motivation on the day, of course, the more motivated you are, the slightly harder you'll be able to push. And the contrary is true as well. And then your general feel on the day. So all of those factors need to be taken into account either to slightly adjust up or down the number that you've, found, you, you've worked out from your, your research. The biggest risk, uh, and I repeat this, the biggest risk is going too hard on the early climbs. If you follow my suggestion here, it will feel like you're holding back and riding perhaps between inverted commas too slowly, uh, but it should feel like that. It must feel like that, in fact.
Okay, you'll know what I mean if you've ridden this uh, event before. If you haven't ridden anything long as, as long as this before, that may seem uh, uh, strange, but, but you, you've got to get that into your head. So that's it for the pacing. Now let's look at um, fueling. Uh, this is almost as important as pacing. Whether you get fueling right or wrong will have a massive impact on your performance. Uh, the first thing to, to take into account is that you will burn somewhere between 8,000 and 10,000 calories, roughly speaking, during the, if you complete the Tour du Mont Blanc. There's absolutely no way to consume that much during the event itself. A quick calculation makes that obvious. A typical energy bar has between 100 and 200 calories. So even if we take the 200, it means you'd have to consume 50 bars during the day, which is obviously ridiculous. So you can't, you, you wouldn't be able to do that. So what to do? It means you've got to start with the full tank and obviously fuel as much as possible during the day. But let's, let's talk first about starting. The way to do this is to eat plenty of carbs during the week before, uh, not only Thursday really, but also, also even Tuesday and Wednesday, plenty of pasta, rice, potatoes, vary the carbs as, you know, it's, it doesn't, uh, you don't have to eat pasta every day by any means. Then when you get to Friday, eat normally. It's too late to really stuff yourself with, uh, with a huge amount of pasta Friday night. Uh, that's an old story and it's been proved to, to not be beneficial. Uh, so eat normally on Friday evening and just limit the fiber. You don't want too, many, too much fiber in your, in your intestines for, uh, for obvious reasons of needing to go to the toilet too much. Then you need to get to bed as early as possible and eat again during the night because the start is at five o'clock and you've got to eat something before the, before the, uh, uh, before the start. So this, my recommendation is to eat again roughly at two o'clock, three o'clock, and again at four o'clock and try to go to sleep again between those two times. It's more important, in fact, to eat and rest than it is actually to sleep that whole night through. The sort of things um, I'm going to eat at two o'clock, I'll probably eat white rice and, and a small omelet. At three o'clock, I'll probably eat some gingerbread or some cake or something like that. And at four o'clock, I'll probably eat some honey waffles or, or something of that nature. Then we get to, of course, we, by, at four o'clock, you'll be getting up anyway and getting ready for the start. From the start, uh, you need to start eating, it, or you need to really continue uh, eating you know, from the very start. The goal here is to consume uh, at least 250 calories an hour. If you're, if you're exceptional or if you've really trained yourself for it, you can consume up to 500. This is what the pros are doing now, but it requires training the gut um, and getting used to it in training. If you haven't done this, if, you, if you've never eaten so much on the bike, uh, it's a lot, huh? 120 grams or 500 calories. It's a lot to eat on the bike. If you haven't done it, it's uh, probably too late now. Uh, so you'll have to go with whatever, whatever you can do. It really depends on what you're used to doing in training. However, I would strongly suggest that you see 250 calories uh, or 60 grams of glue seeds of, of, um, uh, your carbs as a minimum. What does that look like? Well, a bottle of energy mix, of energy mix is typically 120 uh, calories. A gel is between 80 and 120. A typical bar is between 100 and 200. You need to read the label to check. A typical, a small banana is around 100, a medium is about 150. Uh, so it means you need to have at least um, a two, and a, uh, two, two and a half of those per hour. And what I actually suggest is you consume four items per hour, which are going to make up at least the 250, uh, the 250 grams. It's better to have something little and often. So have something every 15 minutes or even something every 10 minutes. Uh, then, save it, then save it all up and eat once an hour or, or even twice an hour. I really strongly recommend little and often and, 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 and uh, keep, stick to that target of at least 250 per hour. What's really important is never to drop behind. Uh, so uh, if you forget uh, at the start to eat for the first half an hour, you'll never really catch that up again. It's, it's worth putting a sticker on your stem uh, or on your bars to remind yourself to, uh, to keep eating. This, these are the feed stations. There are seven. Uh, the first one is at 54 kilometers. It'll probably take the better part of two hours to get there. That's the only one that you might perhaps consider not stopping at if the day is very cool and you still have plenty of water. 
but uh, it seems to me a stretch to reach uh, Les Valettes, the second one at two at 110 kilometers with only two with only two bottles of water. So, uh, frankly, I recommend stopping at every single feed station because if nothing else, you'll need to fill up with water. Uh, you can see what's available there. Um, that's uh, that's what the organization has told me. Uh, I'm sure there'll be bread and, and other things, but uh, you, you can expect at least to find those sorts of things. Uh, as of the um, La Salle, uh, there's hot food, the past, there's hot pasta and hot soup, and the same thing, uh, same thing again at Bourg Saint Maurice. Uh, so you can look forward to that. That that, that can give a real boost uh, in motivation when you get there. So uh, the third key, if you remember, was mental strength. We've talked about pacing. We've talked about um, feeding, nutrition. Now the mental side of it. So long as you're physically fit, you stick to the good pace and you eat and drink enough, the most likely reason to abandon is mental. Uh, for most people, this is going to be the longest, toughest day you've ever spent on the bike and, and probably by a significant margin. So what can you do to prepare mentally? This quote is from one of the world's top experts in the mental side of endurance sports, a guy called Samueli Marcora who's now in uh, Bologna. He was for a long time in the, in the, in the UK. Uh, and this sport perfectly encapsulates the challenge for me. Endurance is the struggle to continue against a mounting desire to stop. And I can guarantee that this will be true for everybody that at various times during the Tour du Mont Blanc, you will have a mounting desire to stop. You will just want to stop and get off your bike because it's too much. So what can we do? How can we deal with that? There are two ways to increase your mental strength and your ability to continue against this famous mounting desire to stop. The and they're complementary ways. You, you can do both, and I suggest you look at both. The first is to increase your motivation, and the second is to reduce your perception of effort. We don't have time here to go into all of these in detail, but I'll give you a quick overview and then point you to where you can find out more. The first point is to have a good answer to the question, why am I doing this? You can be sure you're going to ask yourself this question many times, most probably on the, on the Petit Saint-Bernard and the Cormier de Roselin. But by the time you get to uh, the Cézy, of course, you've, you're on the last climb. So, um, uh, so this question is no longer really relevant. You, you got well past it. But at different points in the day, you're likely to ask yourself, why am I doing this? This is just crazy. And this was a question why I asked myself for the uh, Mallorca 312, and I'm sure I'm going to ask it myself again on the TMB. So for me, the answer to that is I want to prove to myself that I can go the full distance. First on the Mallorca 312, which of course I did, and now on the TMB, which I don't know if I'm going to be able to do, but I certainly hope so and intend to do everything for. The second aspect of motivation is to have, have a clear outcome goal. What is an outcome goal? It's something like to finish, or it might be, uh, you might refine that a bit and say, I want to finish in less than, let's say 15 hours or 13 hours or whatever it may be, whatever's reasonably realistic for you. It's important that it's realistic and, and, and achievable. You know, don't go setting yourself um, a wild guess of if I'm on my best day ever, if I perform like I did on, on the Marmot uh, two years ago, uh, then I could finish in 14 hours. So that's my goal. No, uh, you know, let's be realistic. Let's look at uh, where we are today and set something that we, that, that, that we stand a reasonable chance of succeeding. Otherwise, you're simply going to get um, downbeaten and, uh, and depressed as time goes on and you see there's no way you can reach your goal. So for me, my only outcome goal is to, is to finish. Then there's another category of goals, which are called process goals. Uh, which are things that will help you achieve the outcome. And these are things like stick to the plan. You make a plan and you stick to it. Okay, the plan includes your, your pacing. So climb at 60% or climb at whatever it is for you. Or eat 250 calories every hour. Uh, so those are the type of things you need to look for uh, and, and set yourself as process goals. And they help you stay on track and reach that, that, that outcome that you want. So though, having those goals is important for motivation and, and it in, helps you increase it. Other things that help increase motivation are to, uh, particularly when you go through a rough patch, you may find it helpful to give yourself some positive self-talk. This is really useful to counter that seductive voice in your head that says something like, this is too hard. 
I'm not going to make it. Let's just stop here. Look, there's a nice shady patch by the side of the road. Why don't I just stop here? What does it matter? You know, what, why am I doing this anyway? And so on and so on. And that, that very negative voice that can easily get hold. And if you let it get hold, then you probably will stop. So you need to talk back and have something positive to say. And these might be, you know, these are just ideas. You've got to take what works for you. Some of them might work. Some of them definitely won't. So take what works for you. So it might be things like, look, I've been training for this for weeks, months, years. Um, so I'm, I'm not going to give up now. Uh, I'm so lucky to be here. Let, let's enjoy it. You know, other people don't have my health or my fitness or my ability to ride a bike. So they can't be here. I'm very lucky. So, 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 so let's enjoy it and make the most of it. Uh, keep pushing, keep pushing is an obvious one. Look around. Everyone else is hurting at least as much. They're all hurting, in fact, more than me. So what, why am I complaining? Come on, suck it up and let's get on. And then you can look back and say, well, look how far you've come. You're not going to give up now, surely. You, you, you're halfway through or you're three quarters of the way through. Why would you give up now? Looking at the whole thing can be very, can be overwhelming. Let's say you're, you're in the middle. Let's say you're even on the Col de Champex here, which is very steep. If you don't know it, it's, it's steep and, and, and very tough. It is probably the toughest single climb. In fact, it's definitely the toughest single climb on the whole event. At that point, if you start thinking about the Grand Saint Bernard, the Petit Saint Bernard, the Corme de Rose, and the Saisy, you're likely to say, to hell with it. This is too much. I'm stopping. Uh, so uh, don't think about the whole thing. You need to think step by step. I can get to the top of this climb, and then I'll worry about the next later, the next one later. And if that doesn't work, if that still seems too far, well, I can get to the next corner. Everyone can always get to the next corner. Yeah. And when you get to the next corner, you'll find a little bit more energy and you can get to the next corner after that and so on and so on. So sometimes you have to set very short, uh, easy, short-term goals like that, the next corner or the next distance marker or the next whatever it is, and then take it from there. Other aspects of positive self-talk, you can give yourself instructions or guidelines or, 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 or tell yourself what you should be doing. So things like stick to your own pace, you know, don't try and hold on to that wheel that's going too fast for you. Pedal smoothly, relax your shoulders, all of that, that helps, um, um, uh, helps save energy because energy that's going into a, a bad pedaling style or, or tensing up your shoulders, pulling on the bars and so on is not going into pushing the bike forward. Uh, so all of that's helpful. In descending, one thing you, you might say to yourself is look around the corner to, to remind yourself that uh, you've got to look far around the corner in order to descend fast and safely. And then um, last but not least, seeing yourself at the coming summit or, or even seeing yourself at the finish can be a powerful motivator and a good reason to keep on going. So again, not all of those will work for you. Take what works for you and, uh, and, and make it yours. Now, looking at the other side of the, uh, of the coin is how to reduce the feeling of uh, the perception of effort. It feels hard. It feels painful. But you can reduce that feeling by different techniques. The first of these is distraction. So you, you, you basically occupy your mind with something else so that you don't think about the effort or the, or the pain in your legs. Lots of different things you can do. You can um, relive a memory, a pleasant memory of, of something or other. You can think about your future plans or for your holiday or whatever it may be. Uh, you can enjoy the scenery as it's going past. We're going to be in some of the most beautiful scenery in Europe at times, so enjoy it. Uh, you can focus very, very intently on the rider just in front of you. That can help you to distract your mind from what's going on in your legs and your body. Uh, you can count pedal strokes. I sometimes do that in a foreign language just for fun. Um, and again, it occupies my mind. You can recite poetry, song lyrics or, or mantras. Uh, or you can simply let your mind go blank and think of nothing at all if you're if you're um, if you've ever used meditation, mindful meditation, for example, this is a, a very good technique. There are some other things you can also do which help re reduce that perception of effort. 
uh, this might sound silly, but it's it's literally true. If you smile when you're when it feels very very hard, uh, that actually releases endorphins um, involuntarily. You will release endorphins if you smile, and it makes you feel better. Uh, so sm when the going gets tough, smile, relax. That also helps helps release endorphins. If you tense up, it's the opposite that happens. Your body is going to release stress hormones like cortisone, uh, and that makes things worse. So relax, and you and you will feel better, and it will feel less hard. Uh, you can take a caffeine gel because caffeine uh, uh, has this effect of reducing the perception of effort. Um, for some people, a lucky charm works. Uh, if you have if you have a lucky charm, then take it with you. And again, our old friend visualization. Um, for example, if it's very, even though it's cold, and it can be very cold coming off the, 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 the Grand Saint Bernard, in particular if it's raining. So there, if you're too cold, you have to, you can visualize and say to yourself, even though it's cold, I'm not feeling uncomfortable. I can, I can manage this. I'm okay with this. Okay. Yes, it is cold. I can't deny it, but I'm not feeling too uncomfortable. Uh, another thing you can tell yourself is uh, tidy yourself up, pedal smoothly, uh, be, uh, you know, and, and, and then visualize yourself in your best moments of pedaling. So again, take what works for you from that. Now, the final part of mental preparation is contingency planning. A lot of things could go wrong on your ride, but there's no reason why, why they should stop you finishing so long as you have a decent plan to deal with them. And I'm not talking about a major accident, of course, or a major mechanical, uh, but lots of less serious things can go wrong. Um, and so long as you've prepared for them and have a plan, there's no reason why they should be stop you for more than a few minutes. Punctures are the obvious one. Uh, you should be prepared for potentially two punctures at least. Uh, bad weather is, a, is another obvious one. The, the um, uh, it's really important to look at the weather forecast, of course, but, change, but we're in the mountains and changes can, can happen very suddenly and unexpectedly. Uh, it might be very hot, uh, so be prepared for, for that. Uh, it might, sometimes it, we've seen differences in heat as much as uh, uh, 25, even 30 degrees between uh, the top of the col, uh, the Grand Saint Bernard, for example, and then the, the valley down at the bottom, the Val d'Aost. Uh, there can be 25 degrees or even 30 degrees of difference. How are you going to handle that? Uh, you might find yourself getting dropped. Other riders are stronger than you. What do you do? Do you get dispirited or do you just deal with it? Uh, what happens if you bonk, if you run completely out of energy? That will only, should only happen if you've uh, forgotten to eat. What are you going to do? What happens if you feel sick? That might happen if you eat too much sweet stuff uh, on a hot day. Um, what are you going to do? Cramps, you, could, you might suffer from cramps, perhaps a bit less likely on the Tour du Mont Blanc if, uh, because you won't, shouldn't be riding too hard, but uh, could, could happen. And uh, you almost certainly will at some point feel dispirited, as, as I've mentioned several times already. So again, contingency planning, that's all part of the mental preparation. So uh, think about those things in advance so that you're ready to deal with them if they happen to you. I said uh, it was a quick run through, it was, uh, but you'll find more on the TMB site. If you go to here, Practical Infos, the uh, Alpine Coles training program, and then uh, below that, click on that and you'll find this, uh, this window here, our training guidelines, our training plan, and a document on mental preparation, which goes into what I've just said in, in a bit more detail. So uh, feel free to go and look for that and, and, and use it for your benefit. Okay, now a word about clothing and personal equipment, uh, because having inadequate clothing for the conditions is probably the fourth major reason for abandoning uh, the Tour du Mont Blanc after the first three, that, which I mentioned earlier, the pacing, nutrition, and, and mental strength. So of course, it all depends on the weather. Uh, so it's essential uh, to have a good understanding of the forecast around the whole course, and especially the expected conditions on the highest coals. Okay, what you need to think of is thin layers. It doesn't make sense to carry a big heavy jacket, which, um, which is very difficult to deal with. When, it's fine when you're wearing it, but when you, 
when it gets hot down in the valley and you've got to take it off, it then becomes a major problem. So much better to have a, a plenty of thin layers that you can easily adapt to changing temperatures and changing conditions. So it's things like uh, arm warmers, um, thin jackets, very light rain jackets. Um, uh, the Gore-Tex one you can see uh, uh, Olivier is wearing in that photo is, is brilliant. Um, you might need long gloves if it's potentially cold on the, on, on the higher colds, a gilet, a cap or, or, or a bonnet, a neck warmer perhaps, leg warmers. Depending on conditions, you need to give consideration to all of those things and if necessary, bring them. Now that obviously brings up the problem of how on earth do I carry all that stuff? Well, you don't, you shouldn't be concerned about that, uh, about, um, you know, on a, on a sportive, you rarely see people with saddlebags on their bikes. Uh, you rarely see people with, with backpacks or anything like that. Uh, on the, the Tour du Mont Blanc is not a sportive like the others, it's an ultra fondo. Uh, so um, you shouldn't be uh, concerned or ashamed to have a saddlebag on your bike or a frame bag or, or anything like that, that you can carry extra stuff in. Uh, so that's, in my view, the best way to do it. An old timers trick is to wear two jerseys because two jerseys gives you six pockets instead of just the three. Uh, so that enables you to carry a lot of other stuff as well. Um, one final option is to just to tie jackets around your waist. If, you, if it's a really bad weather and you decide to ride uh, anyway, you might need a slightly heavier jacket and then you might just have to tie it around your waist, uh, which isn't the, isn't the greatest, but, um, but at, least you, you, at, least, uh, at least it's feasible. So let's conclude with the five mistakes to avoid, what I consider to be the five biggest mistakes that, 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 you could, that you could make. The first is to go too hard on the early climbs. I think I mentioned earlier, you should, you, it should feel too easy on the early climbs. If it feels too easy, you're probably doing it right. The second is to burn too many or probably even any matches. You know, this is not like a normal sportive where you need to start fast and make a serious effort to stay with groups. And uh, you're probably pulling uh, 300, 400, even 500 watts for a few, a few seconds here and there to, to get in the right wheels and to, and to go around corners and so on at the beginning of a, of, of, a, of a sportive. It's not at all like that. It's going to start. Some people will start fast. It, mean, it either means they're, they're, gonna, they're making a mistake and you'll see them later by the side of the road or they're stronger than you anyway, and they'll, be, they'll finish way before you, and uh, that's just the way it is. So uh, don't burn matches. The third biggest mistake is to, of course, to forget to eat and drink enough. The fourth is to bring inadequate clothing for the weather conditions. We've just talked about that in detail. And the fifth is to take silly risks when descending. And this is not so much a, a risk at the beginning when, you're, when you should still be quite perfectly lucid and thinking and, and sensible and, and, and doing what makes sense. The risk grows uh, as you go through the event, you get more and more tired and you, you're going to become less and less lucid and less and less able to think straight. So coming off the top of the Petit Saint Bernard, for example, you've got more than 30 kilometers of descent now, it's not an extremely difficult or extremely technical descent, but that's a long, long way to descend and to keep concentrated. So you must do that. You must stay concentrated and avoid taking silly risks. You know, if you're a little bit close to the time limit, so be it. It's better to miss the time limit than it is to have an accident. Same thing, of course, coming off the Cormier de Roseland. It might be dark by then if you, uh, um, uh, if you, if if you're um, uh, if you're still on the road at that time. And descending in the dark is clearly uh, something you've got to, you've got to do uh, with prudence. You must have lights on your bike, of course, that's a, an obligation for the start, um, but you need to have them also for the finish if you're going to take more than about 16 hours. So those are probably the five biggest mistakes. There are lots of smaller ones, of course, uh, but um, at least don't fall into those traps. That uh, concludes what I had to say to you this evening. Uh, I'd like to wish you uh, good luck. I look forward to seeing you in Les Saisies. Please, uh, please come and say hello. I would love to, love to meet you face to face and uh, wishing you a great ride. I'll just conclude with a quick word about the support we, can, uh, we provide. 
Um, we've got, uh, you can come and see us for your training camp needs and your coaching needs. Uh, we've got uh, these events still on this year. There's the Route des Grands Alpes, which we'll be running in at the end of July, and then Discover the Pyrenees in September. And then our first training camp for next year, which is a, a real uh, focus on uh, technique and skills with um, very active coaching, will be in Tenerife, uh, end of January, beginning of February. So if you're interested, be delighted to see you there. Con you can contact us for one-on-one -on -one coaching. And of course, you can always send me questions on info at alpinecalls.com.